So, uh, first question is, why are we here? Why is everybody so interested and fascinated in this space? So for me, it, this is about the aging equation, um, of which probably everybody was from very this year, but it's never worked restated, which is, um, the good news is, is that we're generally, particularly in the developed world, but really globally, we're getting older. Um, and some quite staggering statistics about the percentage of us that will be over 65 over the next few decades. Um, unfortunately, with that, we know comes an incredible burden of disease. Um, most of the uh, top 10 killers in the world are a consequence of getting older. Um, and the health economic consequences of that have been pretty accurately predicted and the crippling effect that they could have you know, on top of all of the other things that we're having to face, including climate and food supply and the rest of it, are pretty dramatic. The other reason that we're here is because uh, we don't, as Brian said, we don't need to be so nihilistic because, because of the interest in trying to solve the problem and that equation, the knowledge we have of the underlying processes that drive aging and drive the diseases that go with it has increased exponentially. And it's probably difficult to go back and know when this actually started, but probably it's 15, 20 years ago. But the technology now that we have, the, the technology of the gods, as Brian put it, has allowed us to get to an incredible point of knowledge in a very short space of time. And really, we're talking about a decade. And if you go back 30, 40 years ago, we thought about what aging was. These are sort of some of the theories. You know, there was a, a somewhat a nihilism that we were pre-programmed to die because it made sense as a species for us not to live forever. It turns out that that's not really true. And that aging is really a pathogenic process that can be modified. Um, and the way I think about it is pretty simple, which is that survival you know, the price of survival is that we die in the end. Uh, two things happen. Firstly, we are constantly being bombarded, bombarded with things that try to injure us and do us harm. Uh, everything from the air we breathe, the sunlight we're exposed to, the bugs on us and in the air and around us, the things we eat and drink and so on. Almost everything that, that is in our environment has the potential to do us harm. Now, we have ways of protecting ourselves against that. But I think what we've come to understand is that those repair and protective mechanisms are imperfect. And over time, as we try to patch ourselves up and try to deal with all the environmental insects, we end up ultimately doing ourselves some harm in that we lose the capacity to regenerate, replicate ourselves. And so with that comes this sort of vicious cycle. Um, so we protect ourselves against diseases, but actually we end up dying as a consequence. We also understand, at an, another level, the deep, deeper biological explanations for what's going wrong, and the so-called hallmarks of aging um, have been expanding over time, and there are probably almost certain things that we still don't know. Um, but we're beginning to get an understanding of what are the critical things that go wrong, and I group them very, very broadly here into cognition, metabolism, immunity, and repair, but that's a very superficial view. But broadly speaking, those are the things that kind of go wrong. And of course, and, and this is of course far, far from being complete, but just there are many, many companies now that are targeting in on these different hallmarks. So there, is, there are reasons to be cheerful. As, as Brian again alluded to, as a consequence, the scientific literature in the field is growing massively on the left hand. This is a pull, pull down of scientific publications, healthing, uh, sorry, aging, health span, longevity from PubMed, which is all scientific medical, biomedical publications go, and it's almost exponential. Um, there, there is also a growth in, in journals, which kind of adds to this, but truly underlying, it is a, a massive increase in interest in science, and with that, interest in, in forming biotechs, businesses, and other entities that can try and translate that science into practice. So I'm a, I'm a doctor, and I moved from clinical practice in critical care and respiratory medicine into the pharmaceutical industry uh, for a very simple reason, is that um, in, in critical care medicine, uh, at the time, and unfortunately largely still now, there are absolutely no medicines at all. There are lots of machines that go pink, um, and I had a very you know, impressive consultant on one end of the spectrum who just said, just make sure you put the numbers in the box, let the machines do their job, and just give it time, and that's the great healer. Um, 
I think we can do better than that, but actually we haven't moved an awful lot further. I'm pleased to say that in the other area that I've worked in, asthma, which if you have asthma or you know somebody who does, you'll know that there's a brown inhaler and a blue inhaler. It's pretty much the sum total of respiratory medicine about 25 years ago. I'm glad to say that there are now 12 to 15 new medicines for asthma. Now I hope we're on that kind of inflection point for health span longevity where you could argue there might be a medicine we're looking at right now, just a bit once. Maybe this is the first foray into a true medicine you could take early in disease or even in health that would prevent multiple chronic diseases. Um, but if not that, there will be medicines coming along. Let's talk a little bit now about how we think we can go about that. Because I'm a prag pragmatist. I know how hard it is to make a medicine. And when I joined industry, I used to say to people, you can either run away in horror at just how immensely complex it is to try and make a medicine, or you can be a bit like Brian and think, no, I'm going to crack this, and I'm going to try and figure out how this thing works. I'm not saying I've made massive progress over the decades, but we do have many, many more medicines, and there has been a dramatic improvement on our ability to do that, but there's a long way to go. So firstly, at the very top level, what are we trying to do? Um, so let, let's talk about longevity and, and health span. So longevity is simply you know, your chronological age, uh, and, and that's, that's good. We all like all the time to enjoy the good things in life. Um, but unfortunately, as we've added years to life, uh, in the top bar here, we've unfortunately added years that lack the quality. So what we want is longevity with quality, and that's health span, the number of life, uh, years you live in good health. Um, so let's have both. Um, I think if we target those underlying drivers of, of aging, we can improve our biological age, the sort of quality of life and experience that we have. And with that, inevitably, will come f further years of life. So I think we can do both. So how do we start to do that? Well, it would be remiss of me not to talk about you know, the simple things. It's not all going to be about medicines. And I think Brian's comments about you know, us as individual human beings and us as a species and the harm that we do to ourselves and our planet, etc., is a good one. Um, so somehow we have to do the simple things well. Uh, and these are some of the simple things that we already know. And Brian is the blueprint for this. He is protecting himself from as much as possible all the things that do him harm. He monitors the air quality where he lives and doesn't go outside if it's low. He doesn't expose himself to unnecessary sunlight. He's very, very pale. Um, he looks at what he eats and so on and so forth. So he is the blueprint for protecting himself as much as possible with the relatively simple things. Now he's also taking a lot of what I would call interventions, not just medicines in the traditional way, but also supplements and so on. And that's what we'll come to. The other aspect of this is going to be how we engineer the advances that are coming into healthcare provision. You know, we, we need to treat populations, we need to manage the health of populations. And very, very simply put, um, and by the way, the, the, the Latin, I, 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 everybody thinks when you go to medical school, you either need Latin or you must have done Latin. Neither is the case. I mean, it helps a bit, uh, but, but neither is the case. Um, uh, but this is uh, prevention is better than cure. And so this is the frequency of hospital visits as you, as you get older. Uh, and why, why shouldn't this be reversed? Why shouldn't you be seeing your doctor more when you were younger and in health and being trained and educated and supported uh, and less as you get older because you've learned how to do that? So there are some big picture things we need to do, but um, I'm the CEO of a company called Juvenescence, which is sponsoring this event. I started in the company about 10 months ago, and I transitioned from a large pharmaceutical company to, to Juvenescence for similar reasons as I moved from academic clinical practice into pharmaceutical medicine, which is I think there's a different way to think about how we intervene to, to achieve the aims we've just talked about. And I think Juvenescence is one of a number of companies that have that mission, that have that ideology, um, and I think have the people capable of doing it. Here are those people. So there's my good self, Jim, uh, I'm sure pretty much everybody knows. Uh, Declan is also a real estate team, um, who's uh, got an incredible track record in pharma R&D and has lived to tell the tale. Uh, and also Greg Bailey, who isn't here today, who's a, again a physician, another physician, a biotech entrepreneur. 
And one of the reasons that I joined Juvenescence was not just because of the mission that I, I believe was a good one and the right one, but also because of these people, because they are interested not, not in a financial return, yes, a financial return, but not just in a financial return. This is a life mission to achieve something of a real value and potential impact. And that meant that you'd be working with people shoulder to shoulder as we do to achieve it. Um, so, so the people is super, super important. So, medicines, how do, we, how do we do stuff to people? Well, we need to do it safely, as safe as possible. So there's another bit of Latin I pinched off the internet, which is, uh, first do no harm. Uh, Prius, no harm, no chair, um, The way we talk about it in sort of medicine speak is therapeutic index, which, uh, when we're doing experiments, is the toxic dose in 50% of cases over the effective dose. But really, you can think about it as risk-benefit. Risk benefit is everything. If you are dying of a cancer, you're, you're going to be prepared to do some pretty horrible things to yourselves. And, and we subject patients to some pretty horrible things at times to get through that individual life. As well. If you are well and healthy in your 20s, you should be very, very cautious about taking anything because you are well. And anything you take could potentially do your harm. So as we think about intervention over life, you know, we have to balance balance that risk benefit all the way along. And that means there isn't just going to be one way of doing it. So the way that we thought about this, and, and, and the founders thought about this before I arrived at Juve Essence, but it, it makes good sense to me, is as we think about our life and we move from health through to you know, our probably inevitable acquisition of various ailments you know, early and then they become more progressive, ultimately what happens is that you know, tissues fail, organs fail, we fail as individuals. Now, of course, prevention is better than cure, and, and there's an opportunity to intervene so primarily when you're in health or very early in disease to prevent further progression. And there's obviously an opportunity to treat those diseases as they emerge, and there's an overlap. So, so, so far, so, so good. But what we need, therefore, is a sort of spectrum, um, a palette, a toolkit of ways in which we can intervene. And you can come at this sort of from either end. And, and all of this is happening right now, as you know. So firstly, you can come from the kind of prevention end. At that end of the spectrum, if you're intervening in health, you really need very, very safe things to do. So, but therefore, it's not surprising that you know, supplementations, natural products, nutraceuticals, whatever you want to call them, you know, have gained a lot of traction and interest. And we're definitely interested in that. But we're interested in really developing them in an optimized way. And as we'll talk about in a moment, you know, very using them in most precise way possible. So you can come, you, but there, and there is much more to do in this space, a lot more to do, and there's a massive, massive gap between you know, putting things on Amazon and FDA regulated medicines. There is an incredible opportunity in the middle to take what are undoubtedly likely very, very good potential interventions that can be safe and effective at a population level, and, and to get the data we need to be able to um, deploy them which we don't currently have, but again, we and others are on that mission. You know, take those natural products and optimize them. Synthetic biology, which uh, again, Brian alluded to, you know, this is a massively burgeoning area. You can engineer natural products, if you know what I mean, um, that again, should have a very, very good safety profile that allows the early intervention. At the other end, you can come from this end, you've got some broadly cell and gene therapy, you can engineer cells can peel back some of the problems of aging, so epigenetic, you know, rewinding, uh, and come this way in the middle of sort of traditional medicines. Um, so, so we at Juvenescent are trying to do you know, some of these things, and, and in some ways all of them. Um, here is our first sort of optimized supplement, which is, I think, the little product that you've got in your, um, your bag. Um, and and you know, you, if you, hopefully you all try this, I mean, it has an incredibly profound effect on you short term. Um, we also think that doing this over a longer period of time with a pharmaceutical grade ketone is going to be really interesting as well and can tackle a number of diseases. Um, so just uh, and, and as an aside, because I'm going to talk mainly about our medicines point um, And the way we thought about building medicines is, again, based on risk benefit. You know, we'd love to take something fresh out of the lab, take it into, into people, and go immediately and use it in a preventative mode. But we need to understand whether it's safe. So for us, there's going to be a two-step process and how quickly you move from 
treatment to prevention can depend on the medicine itself and how efficacious it is and, and how safe it is. So we start by targeting the whole marks of aging that have the potential to modify the, 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 a number of chronic diseases. Um, we start in therapeutic mode by treating those diseases and adding clinical value and in you know, return for the good people that invest in us. But ultimately where we want to go is on the right hand side is that because those mechanisms are pluripotent, we think we can treat multiple diseases and have an impact across a number of diseases. We could certainly start to think about treating people very early in disease or very high risk individuals. We do this already when people say, well, hang on, prevention, you know, that's gonna to be tough, isn't it? We're doing it now. We do it all the time in medicine. You know, most cardiovascular metabolic diseases are treated in prevention. We have cardiovascular risk clinics where people turn up, you blood pressure measured, have your cholesterol done, have your family history taken, and so on. People take antihypertensive blood pressure medicines for decades. You take a beta, um, well, maybe beta box is a good example. If you take an ACE inhibitor, which is an antihypertensive, you don't feel anything the next day. You don't you feel better. You're doing something to yourself. You hope will prevent a cardiovascular event from decades down the line. We do this already, uh, and we've already proven there are ways to get to prevention through this stepwise process of understanding. Um, here is our pipeline. I'm not going to talk about it all because I don't have the time. I'm going to give you two or three highlights, then I'm going to talk a little bit about how we actually do the clinical trials because that needs to change too. So I'm going to just give you three examples um, of how we've thought about building a pipeline in space with the philosophy that I've just outlined. So um, PI1, we'll call it, is an enzyme that actually is involved in blood clotting. But on the left-hand side is some really fascinating data. And these are called capillary biocurves or survival curves. And basically, at the top, 100% of people are alive, and at the bottom, right-hand corner, 100% of people are dead. And these are data from the Amish community in the United States, and they're very interesting for a number of ways. Firstly, their environment is much, much more controlled and much more homogeneous than for most of us. So a lot of the things that contribute, as we've just been saying, to our demise are very, very well controlled in that population. If you look at people that have a gene that means their expression of this enzyme is reduced or absent, they live for 10 years longer. When you account for everything else, you account for their, you know, their, their other genetics, their smoking history, they don't smoke, their alcohol history, they don't drink alcohol, etc. When you allow for all of that, this gene seems to give you 10 years of life. Now, this gene I've been interested in for 20 years as a target for medicines that could stop tissues from scarring. So here we have something where there's this dual potential. Firstly, I mean, if we could get a medicine that could modulate this enzyme early into um, the health, could we, could we do this? But in the shorter term, we think there's a medicine that could treat a number of really horrible scarring conditions of your lung, your bowel, your kidney, and so on. Uh, and we have a, an, an oral medicine, a tablet, that's going into clinical development um, next year. This has been a tough target to get at. Um, similarly, um, there's real interest in a sub stuff called NAD, which is in every cell in your body, and it does a lot of things. It controls the energetics of your cell. It controls how genes are expressed. And there are a lot of supplements, actually, that are trying to restore NAD, and for good reason, because it seems that as we get older and exorably, NAD declines in our cells. And with that comes a lot of the sort of defective repair and immune responses that will come with it. Uh, and generally, it seems like a pretty good thing to do to try and get your NAD back where it should be. The main enzyme that destroys NAD is the CD38. So if you can inhibit the enzyme, Get the NAD back where it's supposed to be. And this is again, I'm just giving you one data point here. This is data from mice showing that rather like the Pi 1 data in the Amish community, even this is a mouse, if you inhibit this um, enzyme CD38, you can enhance life. You shift this survival curve to the right. Um, and again, we think we can treat a number of diseases in the short term. For example, there's, there's incredible data in rheumatoid arthritis showing that restoration of NAD really protects and prevents the progression of RA. But there are many other stories. So therapeutically, we can give this great potential. But this is an example where, again, if we can safely restore NAD, um, isn't that something we can move into prevention mode? Now, now this, is a, this is the 
the sort of new kid on the block that um, Jim alluded to. And actually, I'm, I'm not going to go into this in a lot of detail because I'm going to try and persuade as many of you as possible to go to the Oxford meeting where Martin Zucker, my colleague, is going to talk a lot more about things called plasmology. <coughs> they sound like sort of aliens from other planets, but actually they're, they're part of, of every cell in our body. So on the left-hand side, this is the membrane that goes around every cell you have. It's called a phospholipid bilayer, um, but it's basically fat. And plasmalogens are somewhere between 10 and 60% of that membrane. Unfortunately, familiar story, um, these plasmalogens peak in concentration at about 30, 40 years of age, and then they decline inexorably and we've got over time. And I'm only going to show you one piece of data um, in regards to how that might relate to dementia. Um, but there is, there is a huge amount of evidence to suggest that this decline in plasmalogens um, is a precursor to developing dementia. Um, so on the right hand side you can see that your, if your plasmalogens are low, you can actually measure them in the blood. So they're circulating as well, which is fantastic because being able to measure something easily like that is super helpful when you're trying to make a medicine. So low plasmalogens, by the time you've reached to pick a number, so if you're 80 years of age, you've got a 60% chance of having Alzheimer's. If you have high plasma genes, it's about 10%. Now, th there's also a lot of genetics behind this. So wouldn't it be great if we could restore plasma genes back to where they were when you were 30, 40 years of age? Um, let's just say I encourage you to go and listen to Martin's talk, but we definitely think this is more than possible. Um, this is a good example where, again, because you're trying to get yourself back to health, with something that is quote natural, this could move pretty fast into prevention mode. And actually, one of the biggest questions we have in the company is whether we go first into a supplement or whether we develop a medicine. Now, I think we want to develop a medicine because I think we need to prove in a robust way that if we do restore plasma allergens, that we do get the health benefits. And I think at the moment, the best way to do that is develop it as a medicine and do that. Uh, but if, I think if there was this third way for natural products where you could have robust, you know, regulatory paths that didn't take 10 years and $2 billion, you know, this would fit very neatly into there, but you should be able to accelerate this so you can start to use it at a population level, and that's why we're very, very excited about it. So we're taking multiple approaches to achieving this. So I'm going to finish just by um, my hobby horse, which is about doing trials and how daft and long and expensive they are. Because actually, the other, this is another massive, massive problem. I, I think what we're getting to is a point where actually, as Brian again alluded to, our science and understanding is far, far and away outstripping our ability to deliver the impact from it. Because ultimately, you do have to go and do clinical trials and test this in the people like you and me. And, and one of the big problems we have is that we pick a medicine, we start a clinical trial, and then everybody pretends it doesn't exist for about a year, depending on how long your trial is. Um, nobody's allowed to look at the data, nobody's allowed to analyze it because that might interfere with the outcome. So we wait and wait, and at the end of the trial, we get out and go, oh, we have the wrong dose. We, we have to move away from it. We now have the ability, in a very objective way, to black box analyze trials as they go forward. So for example, AI is the ultimate black box. I mean, we have oversight, but you know, AI will allow us to find drug signals, safety signals, and, and to be honest, to have things fail faster. You shouldn't have to wait a year for the trial to read out a year. If we looked at the data after one month, we, we would have known that it would have failed. The other thing is that you could learn much, much quicker. You get to the end of the trial, and how and anybody who's been involved in any drug discovery you get to the end of the trial, you go, oh, it looks like the drugs work in these 10% of people. But again, you've had to wait two years to find that result. Why couldn't you have started to learn that as the trial is going on? So I think there's an enormous opportunity to change the way we do trials. And I think in this space and domain, we should be pioneers of it. I think we can, again, as Brian alluded to, we can find new drug targets. What's really also going to be super, super important is precision. So where precision medicine is getting the right intervention, the right treatment, the right care to the right person. And, and that we lack still in much of medicine, and in particular in health span longevity now at the moment. So there, there are supplements available, there are natural products now that are undoubtedly going to help increase.
incredible value for people. But we don't quite know precisely which ones those are, and we don't know precisely how to give them to people. So precision is important. I think AI um, will definitely help with that. I think we can conduct digital trials that move fast, that learn, that adapt as they go along, um, and we can get medicines to people faster. And as another example of how we can really innovate in the trial space is to learn a lesson from COVID, because we moved super, super fast, right? But the imperative was there. We moved very, very fast to test more medicines in a condensed form of a period of time than has ever been achieved in human history. So, and everybody came out of the pandemic, oh, that was good, why <laughs> can't, how do we do that again? Well, here's just one small example, um, which is the so-called platform trials, where you're faced with something where you need a result quick. Uh, you can't wait to test drug A, that didn't work. Let's test drug B, that didn't work. It takes too long. So you test them all together, uh, and then you learn as you go. You learn which drugs are working and which aren't, and then you have patients coming into the study, and they're directed according to where you start to find the signal, so you're always optimizing the trial. Still pretty Dickensian in the way that they're conducted versus what I think could be an AI-driven clinical trial. But something like this, I think, would be a fantastic way to, for example, take existing supplements rapidly and sort of test them and look for signals. And this could be done on a, on a country-wide basis. You know, countries that have good digital electronic medical records, which is what EMR stands for, infrastructure and it could be doing this at scale quickly as we did in COVID. Right, I'm on the sofa, so we should wrap up. Um, and again, uh, you know, credit to our founders who, who I think we're already seeing this and, and um, were founders and investors in a number of um, artificial intelligence companies. Dave Robin, you're going to hear from later, uh, is the CEO of one of those companies and that's absolutely critical to our future in the space. Um, and they also developed um, an application which could start to synthesize your own health data. Uh, and there are a number of uh, apps and digital platforms that do it. But we need to integrate this into not just healthcare, but clinical trials. So with that, hopefully a good intro. And I hope you enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you.